For even people who have kind of a cursory knowledge of the Battle of Franklin, one of the more well-known facts is that there were six Confederate generals who were killed or mortally wounded as a result of the fighting. The five that we're talking about today were all brigade commanders, and we get asked a lot, you know, why were there so many general officer casualties at Franklin? Well, the truth is these brigade commanders, they were line officers, so they were right where they were supposed to be. They were with their men. The concentrated fire at Franklin, both small arms and artillery fire, was just furious. So as everyone moved into the storm, you see high officer casualties, but you also see high rank and file casualties. What happens as a result of the six Confederate generals dying, there are lots of stories that come up. And one of them is that all six generals' bodies were brought to Carnton and laid on the back porch. The genesis of that seems to be an account by the McGavick's daughter, Hattie, who said that there were six officers on the porch. We know there weren't six because one of the six didn't die until December 10th. It seems that what Hattie recollected was actually six bodies, just not the six generals. We now know today that there were the bodies of four on the back porch of Carton. States Rights Gist is probably the most unique officer among the six. He was from South Carolina, came from a pretty well-to-do family. He was born in the midst of the nullification crisis, so his father decided to name him states rights. And he was in Charleston Harbor when the war began. He was among those outside Fort Sumter. In fact, I think Gist was one of those who was relaying messages back and forth between the mainland and the, the fort's commander, Robert Anderson. So he was there from the very beginning, but he eventually joined the Army of Tennessee and then, like the others, fought really all throughout the campaigns of 1862, 63, and 64. In early 1864, Pat Claiborne had issued a proposal to arm slaves. And one of those who was very, very opposed to that was states' rights gifts. So even within the Army of Tennessee, among the peers, you had grave differences of opinion. For a long time, it was believed his body was on the porch of Carnton. Elizabeth and Howell Purdue found an account at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill written by a former slave who went by the name Uncle Wiley Howard. Uncle Wiley was with Gist, and he recounted in pretty straightforward detail how Gist was taken to a field hospital after being struck down, but the field hospital that he was moved to was almost certainly the Harrison House. Gist served in Brown's division, and that was Brown's division field hospital that night, so I think that's probably where Gist died. But Howard talked about taking the body from that hospital and burying him at home, really on the other side of Franklin. Gist was buried in the yard of the William White residence until early 1866, when he was exhumed and taken back to his home in Columbia, South Carolina. He's buried today, I believe at Trinity Episcopal Church. Among the Confederate generals who died at Franklin, the one whose death was particularly conspicuous was General John Adams. Adams led this spectacular, tumultuous charge toward the U.S. line, probably just around or after sundown. So Adams is a West Point guy. He had served in the Mexican War, and he's a true U.S. Army guy. I mean, he's, he serves at bases all over the country. He was stationed at Fort Snelling in Minnesota for a while, married a woman who was from Wisconsin. Her father was the post surgeon. She follows him all over. He's actually at a base or a post in California when the war begins. He served as a cavalry commander, but he joins the Army of Tennessee in early 64 because he was part of Leonidas Polk's army that had been in Mississippi. Then at Franklin, he's a brigade commander in William Loring's division, so his unit would have passed probably just west of Carnton. We'll never know what caused Adams to do what he did, but I think the evidence is it's just an instinctual, spur-of-the-moment decision. He comes out of this low ground. One of them said he emerged on horseback out of the smoke. He went right at the colors of the 65th Illinois, and he got there. He didn't get any further. He blasted off his horse. I think he's shot eight, nine, ten times. Horse is killed. The horse laid astride the earthworks for at least a couple of weeks. Adams did get so close to the earthworks that the saddle that was on his horse, Old Charlie, actually has a bayonet puncture mark in the front of it. John Adams is, without a doubt, one of the four generals who was brought to Carnton, but he was moved south very early on December 1st. He was taken directly south to his hometown of Pulaski by, I believe, his first cousin, Thomas Gibson, who later marries into the Chairs family that owned Ripa Villa. So he was probably buried at the family cemetery at Maplewood, probably December 2nd. That's 
that's where he is today. Another very unique one among the five. He's the youngest. He's in his late 20s. He had not been promoted to general until just a few months before the battle. In fact, he'd gotten command in an odd set of circumstances. At the Battle of Jonesboro, General George Manny was removed from command at about 9 o'clock at night by Pat Claiborne. And then Carter was given command of the division that Manny was leading. We don't exactly know why. It's kind of murky. Eventually, that division was given to John Brown, and then Carter became a brigade commander in that division. And he led his men into this storm of fire southwest of the Carter House. He was hit in the abdomen about 150, 200 yards from the federal line, but it was a, it was a terrible injury. The bullet seems to have gone all the way through him kind of exploded out his back. He was helped from his horse. He was taken to the Harrison house. And he seemed to be okay for several days, or they thought he was gonna be okay, but very likely what happened is he eventually got peritonitis. He eventually died on December 10th, 1864. And then the next day, he was taken to Columbia and buried at Rose Hill Cemetery. Carter is there today, still buried underneath a huge magnolia tree. So Hiram Granberry, is another one of these guys that time has almost forgotten. Granberry was originally from Mississippi, but had lived in Texas for quite a number of years before the war. He was an attorney. He lived in Waco for a while. He becomes part of the 7th Texas. Early in the war was captured at Fort Donelson, but then he and Claiborne are linked together most of 63, 64. He was wounded during the Atlantic campaign, but gets back in the army. But he had had some real personal tragedy in his life. He was imprisoned after Fort Donelson his wife took ill. She was at some point taken to Baltimore where she had surgery for what is believed to be ovarian cancer. She was buried in Mobile in a family plot, and then Granberry went back to the army. So by the time of the Battle of Franklin, he's a widower. And so Granberry moved in at the head of the Texas Brigade. Those who saw it said that he was on foot. One of Claiborne's aides, Leonard Mangum, said that Granberry was last seen about 15 or 20 paces from the earthwork. So I think he was just on the east side of Columbia Pike, just south of the line, when he got hit right in the face with a mini ball. He was gone immediately. There is a story that Granberry was found the next morning on his knees. He died and was just frozen in time. The Otho French Strahl is right up there as being rather unique. He's from Ohio, so unlike any of the generals who died at Franklin, he's actually a northerner, but he had moved to Tennessee when he was young in his early 20s. He had settled in West Tennessee. Actually worked with Dan Reynolds, who was another brigade commander in the Army of Tennessee. They practiced law together in Dyersburg. Straw was everywhere. I mean, he fought from Shiloh up until those last moments at Franklin. He'd become a brigade commander. He was also wounded during the Atlanta campaign. He was wounded, I believe, at the Battle of Atlanta pretty seriously. Didn't join the Army until after the campaign was over. So he just recovered from his wound, came in with his men. Straw, like Carter, was one of the reserve brigades in Brown's division. And as they stormed the federal line west of Columbia Pike, just south of Carter House, Straw ended up at the base of the federal earthworks. And there he was, according to Sumner Cunningham, who later was the editor of Confederate Veteran Magazine, he was loading rifles for some of his men when he was hit. I would suspect, based on the nature of the lines and how they kind of angle through that area, he was hit by fire from the other side of the road, and he was hit in the neck. And as they tried to evacuate him to the rear, he was hit again in the head. Years later, John McGavick wrote a letter where he talked about Claiborne and officers of rank were brought to, as he said, my home during the night. I think it's possible that Strahl may have been one of the first brought here because he was the first body they got off the field because they were carrying him when he was killed. And people have many times asked through the years, why did they take these guys to Carnton? You know, they were so close to Carter House, the town itself. Why didn't, why didn't they move them somewhere else? Why Carnton? Carnton was the only place on the night of the battle and on the morning of December 1st where there was any of the slightest semblance of order. What happens to the Army of Tennessee as a result of the Battle of Franklin is obviously catastrophic loss. It's like a great purge. I mean, there is just this unbelievable loss of leadership. The Army of Tennessee that limps up to Nashville is just like a, a hollow shell of what it had once been. And when it collapsed on the second day at Nashville, it collapsed because the heart and spirit was gone. It had died or been lost at Franklin.